Hello, my name is Dr. Roderick L. Roll, and today I will be talking about respiration. Here's our first subjective. Explain why all working cells require a steady supply of oxygen. Previously, we went over glycolysis, we went over the prep step, we went over the Krebs cycle, we went over the electron transport chain. So I showed you how that is part of cellular respiration, how we will take a glucose molecule, break the glucose molecule down into carbon dioxide, water, and energy. So in the picture below, this is that process. This is the standard uh, metabolic reaction that we use to acquire energy. On the left side of the yield sign is the, is the um, reactants. And on the right side of the yield sign are the products. So cellular respiration uses oxygen and glucose reactants to produce product, water, carbon dioxide, and energy. All working cells therefore require a steady supply of oxygen from the environment and must continuously dispose of the carbon dioxide. In this picture, we're at the capillary, capillary bed. The oxygen is diffusing from the capillary into the interstitial fluid. Then it goes into the cell, the tissue cell. Once inside the tissue cell, it goes to the mitochondria, where it will be the final electron acceptor. During the breakdown of glucose, you're going to have several steps where decarboxylation takes place. One will be in the prep step, and the others will be in the Krebs cycle. This is going to generate carbon dioxide. It will then leave the cell and go into that same interstitial fluid, into that same capillary bed, and diffuse back into the bloodstream. Thus, our need to breathe oxygen is directly related to one of the major themes of biology, which is energy transformation. Taking a stored form of energy, potential, and converting it into usable form, kinetic. Next objective, explain and describe how the four types of, of respiratory organs facilitate gas exchange. We're going to talk about four respiratory systems. These respiratory systems will consist of several organs. And these organs are going to facilitate the exchange of gases, oxygen coming in and CO2 coming out. Those four are going to be the skin, the gills, the tracheal system, and lungs. We will spend most of our time talking about the lungs. The interaction of bodily systems allow for life's processes to occur. Two of the organ systems that are involved is the circulatory system and the respiratory system. So the interaction of those two are going to allow for cellular respiration to take place. It's going to allow for the production of ATP to be produced from glucose. The part of an animal where oxygen from the environment diffuses into the living cells and carbon dioxide diffuses out into the surrounding environment is called the respiratory surface. In the picture I have labeled with the red square four different respiratory surfaces, skin, gills, trachea, and lungs. Within each one of those, 
vesicles, you have the respiratory surfaces. It is usually thin, the respiratory surface. It is usually moist and covered with a single layer of cells, maybe called the epithelial tissue. This is where uh, rapid diffusion is going to take place. Um, diffusing oxygen in and diffusing carbon dioxide out. In the picture, we're looking at Dergesia. We're looking at Planera. We're looking at this flat worm that is really, really small. It's really, really thin. So every cell in its body is able to diffuse the gas in and out because it is super thin. It is moist and it has a single layer of cells. That is a very simple animal, but many animals are bigger than that. So however, the bulk of the body does not have direct access to the outside environment. For example, human is super large in comparison to Dergesia, in comparison to that flat worm. Therefore, gases can't just diffuse across our surface, our skin. So we're going to have a different type of respiratory surface. Our respiratory surface that exchanges the gases with the outside environment is going to be called the alveoli. Animals such as leeches, earthworms, and frogs use their entire outer skin as a respiratory surface. In the picture, they have a leech. So this leech is able to just diffuse in oxygen and out carbon dioxide. For most animals, the outer surface is either impermeable to gases or lacks sufficient surface area to exchange gases for the whole body. This is saying most animals are just too big to have the gases diffused through the skin. So these larger organisms, these larger animals are going to have specialized regions of the body surface that is going to have these extensive folds or these uh, these branched tissues. And these two things collectively can provide a larger surface for gas exchange than our skin can even imagine. The specialized body surface for humans is within the lungs and it is called the alveoli. So we're looking at the trachea and how it branches into these two bronchii. And then they branch further into bronchioles. And they continue to branch until they finally reach these little grape-like structures called alveoli. So there's so many alveoli with this thin little membrane that it has increased the surface area by, I don't even know the number, hundreds, thousands, millions. It has increased it so much. It is sort of like previously we covered the folds in the digestive tract. And how the microvilli are these tiny little projections that are on side on top of the villi. And this increases the area for food to absorb into the digestive tract. So this alveoli is similar to that structure. It's just in the respiratory system instead of the digestive system. Gills are outfoldings of the body surface that are suspended in water and found in most aquatic animals. As water passes over the large respiratory surface called the gills, gases will diffuse from the water into the blood and from the blood into the water. In bio 2, you look at many organisms with gills and this is how those fishes and, and, and sharks are able to get in the appropriate 
gases that they require. In most land dwelling animals, the respiratory surface are folded into the body and open to the air only through narrow tubes. So the, the tracheal system and the lung system is the one that we're talking about because those are the land dwelling animals. The first land dwelling animal is this grasshopper. In bio two, you look at this grasshopper, you dissect this grasshopper to see that tube that empties, that empties out into the outside environment. It is the spiracles. So I have labeled in this picture three spiracles. Those are equivalent to our nostrils. This is how the air gets in and out of this grasshopper. So the two types of respiratory structures seen in land dwelling animals are the tracheal system seen in insects and the lungs seen in mammals. We will first look at insects. Insects have and use the tracheal system, which is an extensive network of branching internal tubes called tracheae. And they empty out into those spiracles that I showed you before. So trachea begin near the body surface and branch to narrower tubes that extend to nearly every cell in the body of this insect. This is where we'll spend most of our time, the lungs. Lungs are localized organs lined with moist epithelial cells or tissue. Gases are carried between the lungs and the body cells by the circulatory system. Our next objective is to describe the three phases of gas exchange in humans. The first of the three phases is breathing. Breathing is when you inhale the gases into the lungs and exhale the gas is out of the lungs. This is breathing consists of alternating inhalation and exhalation. The second phase is transport. You have to move the oxygen, you have to move the carbon dioxide. So you have to transport. So transport of oxygen from the lungs to the rest of the body via the circulatory system. The third phase is diffusion. Diffusion of oxygen from the red blood cell into the actual body cell. The delivery of oxygen is used by the body cells to make ATP during um, glycolysis prep step in the Krebs cycle. So the ATP is going to be made through the process called cellular respiration. This same process produces carbon dioxide through decarboxylation. This is a waste product and it will diffuse out of the cell back into the bloodstream. The next objective, describe the path of a breath of air. Let's follow the flow of air into the lung and then out of the lung. Air enters the respiratory system through the nostrils and the mouth. I'm pointing to the nostril with the red arrow in this picture. This is a longitudinal section of a human. In the nasal cavity, the air is filtered by the hairs and mucus. It's gonna then be warmed if it's dry air, if you live up north, it has to be humidified. You have to add some water to it. And there is going to be sampled through these smell receptors. The air <clears throat> passes to the pharynx where the 
digestive and respiratory system meets. So in this picture, I've labeled three parts that make up the pharynx, the nasal pharynx, the oral pharynx, and the laryngopharynx. This picture shows those three sections enlarged. So coming from the nose, nasal pharynx, and the mouth, oral pharynx, and then as they go uh, posteriorly, as they go downward, they'll join into the laryngopharynx. From the pharynx, air moves to the larynx, which is also called the voice box. And then the air goes into the trachea, which is also referred to as the windpipe. The trachea is then going to fork into two tubes called the bronchi. One goes to the left lung and one goes to the right lung. Air will continue down. Air is going to continue into the lungs. The bronchi are then going to branch even further and then further and then even further into what is called the bronchioles. And you can see those branching patterns in the picture below. The bronchioles continue to branch until they dead end into what is called the alveoli. These alveoli look like grape-like structures. These are the air sacs. This is the respiratory surface that is equivalent to the skin in Dergesia or the flatworm. Each of your lungs contain millions of these tiny sacs that provide about 50 times more surface area than your skin. Alveoli is the specialized tissue for gas exchange. Like I said, it is equivalent to the skin in that worm. The inner surface of each alveolus is lined with a layer of epithelial cells where the exchange of gases will take place. If you look at this picture, I've highlighted with these red arrows to the left image. The red arrow is pointed to this thin cell called the epithelial cell. They're very super thin. Gas is able to diffuse across that into that little circled area. That is where the, the blood vessel is gonna be, the capillary. So the oxygen is able to diffuse into the capillary and the CO2 is able to diffuse out of the capillary into that thin cross the cell membrane, but cross that cell, that epithelial cell that makes up the alveoli. The tiny alveoli are delicate and easily damaged. And after age 20, they are not replaced. So if you're under eight, if you're under 20, most of the students that take this course are, you have to be mindful of what you inhale because what you inhale might destroy your alveoli. They're very delicate. So destruction of the alveoli through smoking causes the lung disease called emphysema. When air finally reaches its destination of the alveoli, Oxygen will enter the bloodstream by diffusion from the air and carbon dioxide would diffuse from the, from the capillaries into the air sac. In the picture, we're looking at the actual air sac and how the capillaries are wrapped or enveloped around the alveoli. Your exhale reverses the process. Carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood into the capillary, into the alveoli, 
and then moves through the bronchioles, then to the two bronchii, then to the trachea, then continued out through the nasal cavity or the oral cavity. So this was the path of air as it goes in and out of your body. Now we will describe how breathing is controlled. Mechanism of breathing and its control. Breathing is the alternating process of inhalation and, ex and exhalation. During inhalation, the chest is expanded. The image to the left, you see the person's chest wall is expanding by an upward movement of the ribs. And if you look at the diaphragm, it's being pulled down. So it is going to increase the volume of the lung capacity. So this is during inhalation. Muscles are contracted, intercostal muscles. These are muscles that envelope the ribs. The thoracic volume increased by 500 milliliters during quiet inhalation. Think of quiet inhalation as you at rest. And at rest, a normal person is able to expand that cavity so large that they can add 500 more milliliters of air. The opposite of inhalation is exhalation. So during exhalation, all the opposite things will occur. Muscles will relax. Those intercostal muscles are going to relax. The chest deflates. Look at the picture to the right. The chest is deflating. It's the opposite of, of inhalation. It deflates by downward movement of the ribs and upward movement of the diaphragm. Thoracic volume decreases by 500 milliliters doing the opposite, quiet exhalation. This decreased volume increases the air pressure inside the lungs, forcing air to rush out of the respiratory system. I found a good picture to explain this. As the chest cavity collapses, as the lung collapses, as the diaphragm pushes up, it's like squeezing the cavity, like this balloon. If I squeeze the cavity, I'm going to increase air pressure. If you increase air pressure, it's going to be forced out of the nostrils. You can consciously speed up or slow down breathing. Most of the time, nerves from the breathing control center in the brainstem maintains a respiratory rate of 10 to 14 breaths per minute. This rate can vary, however, when you exercise. Now we're going to cover the outside environment and then the inside environment. Respiratory pressure is always described relative to atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure or barometric pressure is the pressure exerted by the air surrounding the body. This has a value of 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level. It can also be written as zero millimeters of mercury at sea level. That was the outside pressure, 760. Now we'll look at the inside pressure. And before we do that, we have to look at the, the structure of the lungs. The left lung is separated into two lobes. If you look at this picture where the arrow is pointing, you see the upper and lower lung lobe, which is separated by an ob oblique fissure. The right lung where the red arrow is, is separated by, is separated into three lobes by two fissures, the oblique fissure and the horizontal fissure. So collectively, there's five lobes of the lung. 
Both lungs are then covered by two layered membrane called pleura. The red arrows is showing you the outermost membrane is called the parietal pleura and the innermost one is called the visceral pleura. Those two membranes have a cavity within them. The cavity is the pleural cavity. It is a space between the outermost superficial parietal pleura and the inner one, the visceral pleura. Let's look at the movement of air. Air moves into the lung by what is called negative pressure breathing. Let's see where the negative value comes from. During inspiration, the lungs are stretched and intrapleural volume increases by 500 mLs. So as, you, as those muscles contract, as the rib expands, as the diaphragm pulls down, as you increase the volume by 500 milliliters. As volume increases, pressure decreases to a value of negative four. So in the picture, the pressure originally was 760. Now you reduced it by four to 756. This slide explains it again. Air flows from an area of higher concentration, 760, to air of lesser concentration until it reaches equilibrium. The outside environment at sea level is 760 mm millimeters of mercury. Inside the lung was 756 because of negative pressure. So the air is going to flow from air of higher concentration, 760, down to 756 until you eventually reach equilibrium. Then both areas will be 760. Air flows from the outside environment into the lung until equilibrium is achieved. In the arrow, the picture, you see the arrows showing you the direction of the air. When you inhale, you inhale, it's negative pressure. The air is going to flow downward from 760 to 756. At the end of inhalation, lung pressure will equilibrate and be 760. So this kind of summarizes it another way. Air flows from the outside into the lung. Outside was zero. You can also say 760, but this time we're going to use zero. So air flows from outside environment, zero, into the lung. The lung is negative four until equilibrium is reached. Now you should understand why they call it negative pressure. The original pressure inside the lung was negative four because of negative pressure inhalation breathing. Now we're going to do the opposite. Air moves out of the lungs by positive pressure breathing. Everything is the opposite. So during expiration, the lungs deflate, the lungs collapse, and intra, intrapulmonary volume decreases by 500. It's like squeezing that balloon again. As volume decreases, as I remove 500 milliliters of space, as I remove it, as volume decreases, pressure is going to increase to a positive four millimeters of mercury. Air flows from an area of greater concentration to an area of a lesser concentration. So now, inside the lung, where the alveoli are, the pressure is 764 millimeters of mercury. Outside air is 760. So now the flow of air is from high to low. 
So from inside the alveoli to outside through the nostrils. Air flows from the lung outside to the environment until equilibrium is achieved. At the end of exhalation, the lung pressure is now 760. This is another way to look at it. Air flows from the lung to the outside environment until equilibrium is reached. The inside the lung is negative four, outside is zero. So that's positive pressure. Describe the function of hemoglobin and how different factors can interfere with oxygen transport. The human respiratory system takes oxygen in and expels carbon dioxide, but it relies on the circulatory system to shuttle these gases between the lungs and the body cells. But there is a problem with this simple scheme. The oxygen has to bind to some shuttle, some transport molecule. Oxygen does not dissolve in blood, so it has to bind. So oxygen is going to bind to a, a protein called hemoglobin that is inside of the blood. This hemoglobin consists of four polypeptide chains. The hemoglobin is going to load up on oxygen in the lungs, transport it through the blood and unload it at the body's cells in the tissue. In this picture, we're looking at the structure of a hemoglobin molecule. It has four heme groups and each heme group has an iron molecule attached to it. A shortage of iron causes less hemoglobin to be produced by the body. Iron deficiency is the most common cause of anemia. So if you don't have a lot of iron, then the hemoglobin is not going to bind efficiently. Matter of fact, you won't even make as much hemoglobin as your cells need. So each red blood cell contains 250 million molecules of hemoglobin, but someone with low iron won't have that number. Therefore, iron is very important. Oxygen must bind to that hemoglobin molecule. It has a pretty strong affinity for it. Again, oxygen doesn't dissolve in the blood. It is going to bind to a molecule that's in the blood. So that brings us to our next topic, carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless, poisonous gas that can bind to hemoglobin at a greater affinity than the oxygen. So if the two molecules are there side by side, CO, carbon monoxide, is going to bind first. If carbon monoxide binds, then now you don't have the oxygen that is going to come to your capillary bed to diffuse into your cell and go into your mitochondria. Breathing carbon monoxide can therefore interfere with the delivery of oxygen to your trillions of cells blocking cellular respiration and causing rapid breathing. Millions of Americans willfully, willingly, stupidly inhale carbon monoxide in the form of cigarette smoke. And in this picture, that is not cigarette smoke. Yes, marijuana also contains carbon monoxide. Explain how cigarette smoke affects public health. Every breath you take, reminds me of a song, exposes your respiratory tissue to potential dangerous chemicals, some of them carcinogenic. One of the world's, one of the worst sources of air pollution is cigarette smoke. This is why at FGCU, Florida Gulf Coast University, they ban smoking on campus. I still see students do it and professors. More than 4,000 different chemicals are contained in cigarette smoke, many of which are known toxins 
and known to be potentially deadly. It doesn't matter. People still smoke the cancer sticks. Smoking slowly damages the respiratory system over time and it leads to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And it is characterized by a chronic cough, difficulty breathing, uh, irritated epithelial tissue lining the bronchioles will be damaged and the alveoli will be damaged. Once the alveoli are damaged, you lose their elasticity. They, they're not able to expand and hold and bring in the oxygen, the, the amount of oxygen they could bring in when they were more elastic. Again, if you think about the expanding of the rib cage, if you think about how much volume is going to be held if it expands properly, if you reduce the elasticity of that respiratory surface, now instead of you bringing in 500 milliliters of air, you might bring in 300 milliliters or maybe 200 milliliters. Difficulty in breathing is caused by a thick mucus in response to smoke exposure. So in conclusion, don't smoke. Lung cancer kills more Americans than any other form of cancer by a wide margin. I'm pointing to the margin in the picture to the right, 21%. This was taken from NIH. A teen who starts smoking shortly shortens his or her lifespan by over 10 years. So don't smoke. Smoking and secondary exposure are still responsible for about one in five deaths every year in the US. More than all deaths caused by accidents, alcohol and drug abuse, HIV and murders combined. No lifestyle choice can have a more positive impact on your long-term health than not smoking. 